In this episode, we're going to take a look at how to create single ROM modifications for video game boards from the 1970s and 80s. This is part two of two. In the first episode, we looked at how to physically lay out a board so that you can put it in the CPU socket and then put the CPU in your daughter board and make a board that will allow you to make a single ROM hack. Now we're going to talk about how to actually program the ROMs and the PAL. So in this design, we're going to move the ROMs from where they are on the original board and put them directly on our daughter board with one big ROM. Now, that means it's going to be directly on the address bus. It's no longer going to be on the buffered address bus. And also, the address the coding circuit won't be able to access and turn on our ROM for us. So we're going to have to design some PAL logic that will detect when the ROM should be on and turn on the ROM chip. That's the entire point of our PAL slash GAL in this circuit design. So step one is to program the ROM. So the first thing we need to do is figure out the ROM layout. And the easiest way to do this is just to start name and then give it the name of the game you want to play. Um, in, this play in this game we're going to choose Carnival. Um, Sega Gremlin. So I just click into my meme here, meme 64, Carnival. And the meme is going to pop up and we can read the information. Now you can see when we start meme with the, the game name, um, in this case Carnival, that it says on the third line from the top, driver vicduel.cp. You're going to want to remember that name because we're going to use that to look up the information about the ROM layout in the main source code. Now, you're going to have to take your web browser and go to this address, https colon slash slash github.com slash main dev slash main slash tree slash master slash source slash main slash drivers. And then we are actually going to append slash and that driver name that we just looked up. So in this case, we're going to add slash vicduel.cpp. So let's paste that into our web browser, hit return, and what we get is the source code for the main games driver. And what we want to now do is go down to the find the ROM section for the game that we're looking for. This is usually going to be at the bottom. Scroll all the way down until you see ROM load. Or um, a ROM start, I'm sorry, and then find the game that you're interested in. So we're going to go, we want Carnival, ROM start depth charge, no, that's not it, Sub Hunt, nope, Safari, Safari, Frogs, and Sub, Space Attack, Space Attack, Space Attack, Head On, Head On, where's Carnival? Did I skip by it already? Ooh, where is it? Come on, Carnival. There it is, Carnival. So we got here, finally. And we see the ROM um, um, loading information. And you see it says ROM load, and then it's got a ROM name, and then it's got a start address, and a size. Usually they'll be right in order of each other and we only want the 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 code that is under the main CPU section here. So it's going to be uh, U30, the one ending in 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, then 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And first we have to make sure that there are no skips in this basically. So it starts at a zero goes to four, eight, C, one, four, eight, C, two, four, eight, C, three, four, eight, C. So it's in order, which it usually will be, but sometimes that you'll actually see skips. And if it skips, you have to be aware of that. Uh, most games, it's going to be in order. So what we're going to do is put them all, copy them all into one big file in order, and 
then we also have to notice where the game starts at. In this case, it's zero, which makes life really easy. But if it was started at something like eight zero x eight zero zero zero, we would actually have to put some space padding before the ROM start. But in this case, it starts at zero, so that's great. So let's go ahead and now we actually have to go and get these main ROMs and then copy them into one big file, putting them in order. So you want to write down the order here and then you want to write down the start address. And if for some reason they were not, each one didn't immediately follow after the other, as far as the numbering order, you see it's increasing by hex 400 each time. If, if there was a, if there was a incorrectness or a, um, a skip between the one and the next. Um, and there is some games in the Carnival, I can't remember which one it is, or in the Vic Duel that, um, that actually have a weird load address where they, it skips some. You, you have to be aware of that. But let's download the ROMs and then we're going to copy them in order from 33 down to 26 and then from 8 down to 1. Okay, so we're going to copy the ROMs now. I put them on my desktop, so I'm going to CD to desktop, carnival, do a listing, and here are our ROMs. Again, we have 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, uh, U8, U7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That's the same, actually the same order that they were listed. So um, we're just going to do the copy now. So we're going to do copy minus B. It's very important you do that if you're using Windows, you have to use copy. Um, not minus slash B, and then just put the the numbers of the ROM names in order, separated by a plus. So, star U33. It's just a shortcut when I hit tab. It's going to actually expand to the actual ROM name plus 32 plus 31 plus uh, what was it? 31 U30. Oops. Did that one wrong? Plus. Plus U28 plus U27 plus U26 and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And let's do the, the rest of them U8, 7, U6 plus U5 plus U4 plus U3 plus U2 plus U1. Okay, so there should be 16 ROMs there, because I, mean, I just know, happen to know that there's 16 ROMs in the carnival. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Make sure the ordering and the names are right, because if you do this wrong, it's not going to work. Uh, so we're going down 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, then the, for the last thing, you um, don't put a plus and then you put an output file name. It's going to copy all the ROMs in order back to back to whatever name you call it. So I'm going to call it carnival um, single.bin. And make sure it gets all of them and um, make sure the size is correct. If I do a dir, I should see carnival single dot bin is sixteen three eight four, which is correct. That's sixteen times one thousand twenty four. All right, so they all got there. If if there's the size is wrong, make sure again that you typed it in all correctly. So now here's a trick. Now well, actually, before we talk about that, if the load address was not zero, we would actually have to add some. Um, some bytes into the the ROM first, um, and I'm going to show you how to do that. Even though we don't do that with Carnival, okay. Um, to do that, hex workshop. That's what I use. Open, and then go to your desktop, Carnival single dot bin, and you'll notice that, I'm just going to resize this stuff, so it's 16, um, it starts at offset 0. If for some reason, let's say the, the game code started at offset 1000 in hex, 
we would actually have to add 1,000 bytes in, or hex 1,000 um, bytes in there. So the way we would do that is just go to insert a certain number of bytes. Let's say it was 1,000 hex, and then fill with the following. Usually you do FF because that's what um, un that's what ROMs are that um, are empty basically. Um, it might be 002 zero, um, depending on the game, but um, we put FF in there and then you would save it. So we'd go up and we'd see there's a thousand FFs, uh, uh, hex a thousand, which is 1024. Um, actually, that, that's, not, that's, that's actually 4096 in decimal, not 1024. And so we see then the ROM starts. Now in this case, we don't actually need to do that because a carnival starts at zero. So we're just going to delete that. We're going to not make any changes. Okay. So we have a single ROM. Now, here is a trick, something you have to be aware of. Um, in a lot of games actually um, mirror the ROMs in multiple locations. So you have to determine. How do you determine that? That's a good question. Um, you can look at the schematics, um, or you can look at the the, the main um, ROM settings, or the, I'm sorry, the driver setting, and you'll, you'll see a mirror section. It's too complicated for me to tell you really um, the, the, the different, I'm trying to think of an easy way to just, an, a fail safe way of like finding out what the mirror addresses are. But um, um, you can look at the schematics. That's the, that's the way I would say to do it, is look at the schematics. Um, in this case, Carnival is actually mirrored again. So the ROMs are from zero to 4,000 in hex. And they're also, a copy of them is actually from 4,000 to 8,000. So actually, and for this to work, we actually have to um, replicate that. So we want actually another copy of the the ROMs or the fourth the, the hex 4,000 bytes immediately after that. So um, what we can do here is just use that copy command again. Copy minus B, carnival uh, single plus carnival single dot bin and I'll call it carnival carnival single done or yeah let's call it done dot bin um, I actually am going to call it SRVP single run prototyping board because that's what I would name all of mine and let's do a DIR and now we see we have a one that's twice this large and again, if we pull up Hex Workshop, oops, sorry, and we load that single and resize it. Let's look at the first four bytes: 18, 24, C3, 6A. If we go down to 0x4, now we're going to actually see those exact same four bytes. Well, all of the bytes, because it's actually replicated. It's There's two copies of the ROMs immediately after each other. Or, or one copy immediately after the next. Okay, So we actually have 0 through 8,000 uh, hex. 8,000 zero, zero, zero hex. Okay? Um, that's important. If you have mirrored ROMs, you have to you have to mirror the ROM um, data in the same offsets that it is in the names expecting it. Now, how do you know? Let's say you, you look at the schematics and you're not sure, or you look at the main code and you're not sure if it's mirrored in multiple places. Well, think about it, um, figure out where you think it's mirrored, and then use MAME to verify that. Um, so we'll just go to CD, MAME, MAME, 64, Carnival, minus debug. And what I'll do here is I'll just pull up my new memory window. And I know that they start at, um, at 0. And I see 18, 24, C3, uh, 6, 4. Let's say I, I thought it was mirrored at 4,000. I can just go check. I can go to 0x, 4,000. And you see we have the exact same bytes. Okay. You probably want to use a, a couple, you know, use a couple bytes and, and verify them um, 
because you know if you just look at one byte, it just happened when you go to the mirrored address, it might happen to have the exact same byte there. But um, here I chose four bytes because the likelihood of the exact same four bytes being in a row is uh, like one. Uh, what is it? One in four billion? Is that right? 256 times 256 times 256 times 256. Yeah, four billion. So that, you know that's a pretty good, you know, um, estimate that it's right. All right. All right. Um, let's say I thought it was also mirrored at eight thousand. Well, I just go to eight thousand and find. Oh no, it's not. So it's not mirrored at eight thousand. Um, Carnival only mirrors it at in zero through three f f f and four thousand through um, seven f f f. Okay. So. That's a quick way you can verify whether you, your mirroring is correct or not, if your, your assumptions are correct or not. Okay, great. So now we know that it is mirrored, and we have a ROM file that has all the data, all the ROM data in a row and mirrored in the proper locations. So the next step is to determine when the ROM should be active. Keep in mind, um, we're going to remove the, all the actual original ROMs from the main board. We made that big single ROM, which we um, that single ROM file, which we will burn to a 27512, and we have moved basically where the ROM is located, the ROM code from the buffered address bus and put it directly on the address bus. And the address decoding circuit is no longer going to do anything for us because it can't actually reach our chip. So what we need to do is program the GAL or PAL on our, our board to basically act as an address decoding circuit. And what that means is we need to determine based on the game board itself schematics when the ROMs are actually active, what signals from the CPU specify that a ROM should be in be being read and being um, fed data to the CPU? So we need to look at the schematics and figure out when what signals should be active when the ROM when, the, when the, the CPU is expecting to read ROM data. And then we have to build some logic to actually um, trigger this for our actual chip. But again, we have to actually first figure that out. So we need to look at the schematics and determine when the ROM should be active. So here are the schematics for the dual VIC game board. And here's our CPU here. And what we see here is a signal called ROM read or not ROM read. Basically, this signal, when active, when low, will activate this buffer, which allows the ROM data to pass onto the data bus. Okay, so here this is actually the the ROM section of the game, and there's actually a buffer here that stops the data from these chips from going into the data bus until this ROM read signal is low. So we have to figure out when is ROM read low. Well, if we follow ROM read back, we see it comes from an NAND gate. And the NAND gate is, which means it's not AND. So when this input is true, and this input, pin 5, which is MEMR, which is mem read, and um, this one here, which we'll look at in a second, when these are high, and only when these are high, this will go low. So these two situations have to be true for this to go low, and when it's a read, it's going to be low. So basically, MEMR has to be true, and the, the output of this gate, U25, has to be true. Well, what's the output of this gate? This is an inverter, so it just means the opposite of whether the input is. And the input is A15. So when A15 is low, this becomes high, 
And then, so A15 has to be low, and mem read has to be high for the ROM read signal to be generated to low. So it's mem read and A15 low. So you're going to want to write that down. Mem read, A15 low. So we know A15 just has to be low. That's a given. And that's the only address bit it seems to care about, is that A15 is low, and then mem read is true. So if we scroll down, we'll see mem read here is, um, is high when RD, uh, pin 21, not RD, is low, and when pin 19, not MREC, is low. When those are both low, they go into pin 6 and 5, respectively, of the 74LS02, where they're inverted. So if they're low, they become high, and then that's an AND gate. So if they're both high, MEMREC is high. So basically, pin 21, not RD, pin 19, not MEMREC, equal, both being low, equals MEMR being high. And that's what we want. We want MEMR high, pin um, A15 low. So if we expand MEMREC, it ends up being not RD low, not MEMREC low, and A15 low. If all of those are true, not, I'm sorry, yeah, um, the, the ROM read signal will go low and the ROM will be accessed. So write this down. Read is low, MEMREC is low, and A15 is low. So now the next step is to program the PAL or GAL that's going to go on the board. And all this chip does is basically act as the address decoding circuit. Um, because we move the ROMs from where it was in the, the PCB board, we're going to remove them from the actual PCB board, and we put all the ROMs now, we burn that to, um, we, we create that single file, and we're going to burn that to our, our big EEPROM, our uh, 27.512 EEPROM. We now have to actually tell that EEPROM when to activate. And this is the gale on the um, SRBP Pro Z80 board and the, the pinout. And you see that address lines 15 through 10 are run there. So when the CPU accesses these address lines, we will see it. The gale will see it. We also know, see when it says um, not read, when the CPU asserts not read, um, not mem request. We also have not write not IRQ, not wait, not bus request, not refresh. Now we really won't use these ones. We're going to use A through 10, not read, not mem request, not this one right here, not output enable. So all of these except for not output enable and the, uh, the VCC and ground and the ones that are not connected are inputs. Okay. The not output enable, that is pin 19 on the chip, is actually we will generate that signal based on the inputs, basically based on the address bits that are enabled or disabled, as well as the, the, the not read signal and the uh, not mem request signal. Now, what we need to do, though, is write some logic in a special file called a uh, PLD file that we will compile into a JED file that basically says when to set that pin 19 to ground, which will enable the chip, the ROM, all the address bits are already run to the ROM from the, the CPU, and the data lines also go back to the CPU from the ROM. So all we have to do is turn on the ROM at the right time, and make sure that we're turning it on the right time and not when other things that are not the ROM actually should be active. So we just have to basically decide, write a um, a logic equation that says when to make not enable turn on. So let's look at one of these PLD files. So now we need to create the PLD file which is compiled into a JED file. And what we have here is we have um, this information is just basically notation note information. Um, I don't even know if you really need it but I had it in there 
um, with a template JED file that I first got had it, so I just left it in there. I mean, I obviously changed it to be whatever. Um, then you want to label your input pins and then give them a name. And we just do pin in capital space and the number equals and then a name. That we'll use that name later when we write the equations. Okay. So you could, if you want, you could actually add all, and it's probably a good idea as a template to add all the pin names in there. We know pin um, two is a fifteen. Pin three equals a fourteen. Pin, and don't forget the semicolon at the end. Four equals a thirteen. Pin five equals a twelve. Pin six equals uh, a eleven. And pin five equals a 10. So we know all these are all the inputs that we generally care about on the Z80. Um, so even though there's more on the gal when I made it, I, I just loaded basically everything that I thought I might need and then I realized I don't need probably any of that other stuff. So whatever. Then we also have the output. We only have one output, pin 19, and I just call it not OE. You could all also call it, oh that's that for not auto put enabled. You could also call it not RD, you know, ROM, read, or something. That just means um, that is the pin that the output pin, and that we will write to that. And then you make a logic equation. Um, don't worry about this one right now. That uh, you might not make make sense to you. But we we said that the output was uh, the the ROM. The output enable should go low, telling the ROM to be accessed when. Pin 15 is low, so we do 15, A15 not. That means um, if I did A15, that would assume that would be saying when A15 is high. We want it actually when A15 is low, so we do a bang, which is or the exclamation point, which computer scientists call bang, and uh, means not high. So it's not high, it's low, and not read, which is pin. Um, um, well, it's pin 8 on the PAL, but it was I don't remember what pin it is on the Z80. But we wanted that one to be low and not Memrec to be low. So when all these are true, that is A15 is low, not read is low, not Memrec is low, OE, our pin, uh, or our variable OE, we're creating a new variable that doesn't actually map to a pin. That will be high. That means we want the read to be to the ROM to happen. However, the chip, the ROM chip actually expects a low signal when the ROM should be reading. So then we just do this, we invert it, not OE equals um, bang OE. So here we make, when all these are true, when A15 is low and um, not read is low and not memorec is low, this variable that we create will be high. Um, and that's when we actually want the ROM to read. but because we're actually direct controlling the physical output of that pin, the signal, we actually want that to be low when this is true. So we just do a not OE. And um, now all we have to do is compile it. So let's save it. And then I use WinCouple, which is free. You just Google it. Uh, do open and there. So now we have to go to devices click device in file. Well, actually, we want to make sure we have the device there. Package type dip, manufacturer AMTEL device ATF16V8B, which is basically the compatible to the, the AMTEL part 16V8. All right, now we want to click device in file off. Click OK, and then hit the, oops. OK, so I got an error, and I, I see why my error is I had pin 5 renamed twice. This should be actually pin 7. Okay, So we'll save it. And because you can edit it right directly in this editor. And let's try again. Device dependent compile. And we should have a JED file here somewhere. There it is. Carnival.jed. This is what you'll use to your, to your programmer uh, to burn that actual image. Alright, that's it. 
Now put it all together and uh, everything should work.